Good morning, Borida. Welcome, Kroisho. We'll continue looking at various aspects of what the scripture teaches on important and interesting matters. And this morning I've been asked if I would look with you at the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 10, Acts and chapter 10. And under the title of God Loves the People We Can't Stand. God Loves the People That We Can't Stand. I found that uh, title to be a bit harsh, so I've changed it uh, to be God loves the people that we don't like. God loves the people that we don't like. I prefer that. Okay, now Act 10 is quite a big chapter. So as usual, can I invite you to hit the pause button, read it, uh, and then hit the restart button, and I'll still be here. If you could do that, it would help me enormously. Off you go. Well done, welcome back. Now, for the Israelites of uh, Jesus' day, the world was very neatly divided into two categories of people. They were Jews and they were Gentiles. Jews were Hebrews descended from Abraham, the father of their race and the father of their faith. If a person didn't qualify as a Jew, then by default, that person was unceremoniously dumped into the category of being a Gentile. Jews were God's chosen people and they knew it. They considered Gentiles to be a second-class citizen uh, and those who didn't qualify as God's chosen were incorrectly, incorrectly labelled by Jews as God's enemies. Now, Acts 10 is a brilliantly told story in which God challenges the early believers in the Lord Jesus. He challenges the early church predominantly to be found in Jerusalem, concerning their attitude towards outsiders, towards Gentiles. The first followers of Jesus were Jews. The early church was all but exclusively Jewish. However, this chapter in Acts brings us to the unmistakable conclusion that God loves all people, that the Lord Jesus died for the sins of the world, He died for the sins of all people. Yes, even those that we don't naturally like. Now, I want to analyse this chapter under three headings, as per normal, if that's okay with you. First point I just want to make is, is that we start off the chapter in the house of a Gentile God seeker. Without any preparation, we're introduced to a Roman centurion who would have come from Italy, we're told that in the scriptures, and whose name was Cornelius, and we are provided with a quite astonishing description of the way of life that he and his family observe. They were clearly Gentiles, no doubt about that. They were strangers to the covenant promise, but yet they were believers in the God of Israel and they were seeking after a deeper understanding of spiritual truth. Now, this centurion, Cornelius, is assured that his fervent and regular prayers have been heard in heaven and are about to be answered in a manner that will bring him and his whole household to a new and a deeper understanding and a deeper knowledge of God. God, through an angel messenger, tells Cornelius to send men uh, to Joppa and to bring back to him, bring back to Cornelius, Peter. And that's the one that we know as Simon Peter, a pillar of the early church, the preacher on the day of Pentecost when thousands, you remember, were saved. That's the first point. Second point, well, really, it covers verses 9 to 23, and uh, I want to call it the reluctant missionary. The reluctant missionary, and I'm referring there, obviously, to Peter himself. The same day as Cornelius had a vision, we find Peter in his house in Joppa. He's on the roof. What's he do- what is he doing on the roof? Well, he's praying. We're told that that was his custom. Uh, to pray uh, from the roof of his house. He is also given a vision by God, accompanied by a command from God, which appears astonishingly to break Jewish law, to break kosher law, 
and Peter, well, is astonished and understandingly, to start with, refuses to obey this command. Now, bang on cue, bang on cue, the messengers from Cornelius arrive and they say to Peter, who's rebelling against what God has said to him, that he, Peter, must go to, with them uh, to see their master, Cornelius. Hello, says Peter. What's happening here? Uh, it might well be that there's something uh, particularly special happening. I need to think about this. Peter is initially very reluctant, but then realises that maybe God is uh, wanting to teach him something or the other, and so in faith, he, Peter, sets off with these men who have come to fetch him. Right. Now then, the third part then uh, of what I want to say to you, and, and it's this really, that in this incident we find Simon Peter, well, having a spiritual awakening, a spiritual awakening, and we see as well a vital step in the spread of the gospel. When Peter gets to Caesarea, he finds that in anticipation of his arrival, Cornelius has gathered together a large number of people to listen to what Peter has to say uh, to them. And suddenly, and suddenly, the vision to Peter starts making sense. The penny drops. And Peter realizes that God is telling him that the gospel is for Gentiles as well as uh, the Jews. His opening comment as he speaks to this crowd, recorded for us in verse 28, makes that abundantly clear. He says to this crowd of Gentiles, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. And as he develops, develops what he wants to say to them, well, he goes on to say, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. And to remember that as he preaches, as he preaches, well, we're told that dramatic things happen. The Spirit of God falls upon this Gentile congregation. We're told that there are spiritual, super-spiritual, supernatural manifestations experienced. We're told, hallelujah, that these Gentiles will come to know the Lord Jesus as Saviour. Very many of them are converted and are baptised. The gospel under God's hand is on the move. We've seen it moving out from Jerusalem in the earlier chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. And here in chapter 10, we see a very positive advance of the gospel moving forward into the realms of the Gentile world. Now, the uh, theological implications of these scenes are enormous. We see God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty in bringing together Cornelius a Jew and Peter, sorry, Cornelius a Gentile and Peter a Jew and using Peter to preach uh, to these Gentiles. And we see Gentiles being saved. And this has a message, really, in its application with regard to our attitude, yours and mine, towards people whom we don't naturally relate to. Regardless of how we feel towards various segments of society, our priority always needs to be the proclamation of the gospel and an acceptance that all people, that all people might have a specific plan in the terms of God's sovereignty and salvation. May our view of the gospel, may our vision of the gospel, well, take that on board. And it may be, and may be, uh, the case as we reach out to people round and about us in these days. Thank you ever so much for listening, as ever. God bless you. 
God bless you. I'll see you soon. Bye now.